Hello, everyone. How are you today? Thank you for being here for our event. My name is Deb Colburn. I'm the chair of COSRO, and I'd like to welcome you to our event. Um, COSRO stands for the Commission on the Status and Role of Women. COSRO is a conference-wide committee, north, south, east, and west. We educate, advocate, and celebrate women in the United Methodist Church. We help the church recognize every woman, clergy and laity alike, as a full and equal part of God's human family and the need for women to be involved at every level. Two things I want to tell you before we start. Today's event will be recorded and we are going to mute everyone until the question and answer period. So just so we don't hear any background noise or dogs barking or doorbells ringing, some of our committee members will be helping out today with the program so you can put a face to a name. And Pat Wilson will open us with prayer. Let us pray. Most gracious and holy Father, we come into thy presence, Lord God, thanking you for this our initial meeting. Bless, bless us, O oh Lord, as we get started. Move, Lord God, into the presence of this meeting and be in the midst of it. Make it successful, O oh Lord, and help us as we move forward. Help us to do the things that we need to do. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. So now, um, thank you, Pat. Now we have a short video. It's a, about two minutes long, and it's called Ever Forward in Our Journey. It's in General reference to the 50th anniversary of the General Conference, the General Commission on the Status and Role of Women on the status and role of women was created in 1972 during a pivotal point in time where women sought equal rights, equal opportunities, and greater personal freedom. Fifty years later, there is still a lot of work to be done. Every annual conference appointment season, we are contacted by bishops and district superintendents who need help navigating a congregation's resistance to a woman pastor. But congregation acceptance is not the only disparity in our church. There is a disproportionate number of women facing sexual harassment. There is a lack of representation in positions of power. And we still don't have equal pay for equal work. G. Kosro knows this. We exist to challenge the United Methodist Church for equal responsibility and participation of clergy women and lay women at all levels of the life and mission of the church. We do this by providing educational resources, tools for analyzing conduct and inclusivity at gatherings, leadership development training, and guiding the church in the prevention and response to sexual misconduct. The church has always been at the forefront of societal movements with the leadership of women. This has proven that when we come together as a whole body, we can transform the world. As we celebrate the last 50 years of accomplishments, we pause to remember the work of those who paved the way and to recognize the hardships they had to endure so that we can continue to move ever forward on our journey. We challenge you, the members of this annual conference, to join us. Join us in imagining the next 50 years. Join us in our vision of creating equal responsibility and full participation of women in the United Methodist Church. During your next break, I encourage you to talk to your annual conference COSRO to get involved. And if you don't know who your COSRO chairperson is, talk to your bishop. So 
So our committee chair, our committee, <laughs> our committee member, Janet Mills will introduce our speaker for today. Greetings all, thank you. It's with my pleasure to introduce a wonderful person who assisted me and uh, created a American Heart Association campaign at my local church, James Memorial United Methodist Church in historic Germantown. Uh, I want to say that um, by uh, meeting her, she uh, provided so many goodies for us. As you see, I have a lot of goodies for American Heart Association. And um, it's just such a warm personality. I thought she would be perfect as our speaker today. Her name is Dina Weems Thornton. She's a graduate of Kutztown University. Dina majored in communications with a concentration in public relations, which she must have excelled in. Additionally, she has earned certificates in fundraising, public relations, and corporate social responsibility. Currently, she is pursuing an MBA in uh, organizational management from Eastern University. All right, a connection there. Uh, Dina worked in the radio industry for 14 years, even though she looks like she's 18. Dina worked, in, uh, she's also uh, has transitioned to working in nonprofit sector at Community College of Philadelphia and uh, Bibashi, which is another nonprofit in our city. She currently works for the American Heart Association and um, um, from the National Office as a portfolio advisor for health and well being. In her role, she leads content development for Healthy for Good, Healthy Bond for Life, Mental Well-Being, and Workforce Health. She oversees digital marketing, strategies, and tactics. Dita is involved in several philanthropic, community, civic, and social responsibility initiatives. In 2001, six, seven, eight, and again in 2009, she was named one of the Philadelphia's most influential community leaders by the Philadelphia Tribune magazine for local leadership of Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority Incorporated. Dina is married to Tony Thornton and is the proud mother of nine-year-old son, Jonas. Ladies, with my pleasure, I'd like you to know and hear and present to you our speaker for the day with a big heart, little pun, Mrs. Dina Weems Thornton. Thank you. Thank you, Janet, for that wonderful introduction. I'm so pleased to be with you all this afternoon. When Janet reached out to me, uh, I'm in a new position for what I used to do previously in the GORET. Um, position in Philadelphia, but I said, you know what, it's going to help anyway. <laughs> so what we're going to talk about today is building a, a healthy lifestyle. And so we're going to go over the PowerPoint with like American Heart Association's life, simple seven things that you can do to improve your heart health and overall health. So what is cardiovascular disease? Cardio is a broad term for a variety of possible conditions. And so let's talk about the conditions. So you see here on the screen, heart attack, stroke, high blood pressure, heart failure, arrhythmias, heart valve problems. Um, these are conditions that impact heart vessels. The two we hear about most are heart attack and stroke, which are caused by a buildup of plaque in the arteries called arthritis atherosclerosis. I can never say that word. <laughs> this buildup narrows the arteries, making it harder for blood to flow through. Um, it can block the blood flow. Uh, it occurs when the blood flow to a part of the heart is blocked by a blood clot. If this clot cuts off the blood flow completely, the part of the heart muscle supplied by that artery begins to die. A blood clot impacting a blood vessel that feeds the brain can result in a stroke. Other forms, forms of CV disease not caused by this plaque buildup include high blood pressure, 
um, which is the rate at which blood heart, heart, which is the heart, when the heart is unable to pump blood as it should, irregular heartbeats or arrhythmias and issues with the valves in the heart that re re regulate blood flow. For the purposes of this presentation, we're gonna focus on the two main forms, heart attack and stroke, and work to prevent this buildup of plaque and reduce our risk of these CV events. So facts about heart disease in women. You know, heart disease is in women. Most people think that it's breast cancer, but in reality, heart disease kills and forms of cancer combined. This is one in three deaths per year. And, you know, that's approximately a woman every minute. Now they may be talking for about two minutes. So that just gives you really a perspective on how important it is that we fight heart disease and how dangerous, dangerous it is for women. Um, so let me just keep going here. So let's talk a little bit about the signs and symptoms of a heart attack. If you have any of these signs, call 911 and get to a hospital right away. Um, uncomfortable pressure, squeezing, fullness, pain in the center of your back or chest um, that lasts more than a few minutes or goes away and comes back. And so let's just talk through these a little bit. So I mentioned pain or discomfort in one or both of the arms, back, the neck, the jaw, or the stomach. Did you know that um, a heart attack symptom could be, could be related to back pain? So, you know, if, if your heart is in distress, the pain can show up in different ways, not just the, clunk, the clutching of the arm that we've seen in TV and movies. It can present itself in a lot of different ways, including upper back pain, uh, shortness of breath, with or without chest discomfort. So your chest may not hurt at all. Um, other signs include um, breaking out in a cold sweat, nausea, or lightheadedness. And I know what many of you are probably thinking that some of these symptoms sound a little bit like menopause. So you have to think about the combination of the symptoms to try to figure out whether or not, whether or not it's time for you to call 911, but better to be safe than sorry. Um, as with uh, men, uh, women's most common heart attack symptom is chest pain or discomfort, but women are somewhat more likely than men to, to experience these unusual symptoms like shortness of breath, uh, nausea or vomiting, vomiting and pain or jaw pain. So, you know, it's very rare, but not impossible for a man to feel jaw pain when he's having a heart attack, but it is a symptom. So again, if you have any of these symptoms, call 911 immediately. Don't, if someone you're with has it, uh, this is not the time to jump in the car and go to the ER. This is the time to call 911 because you don't know how serious the person's condition is and you wanna make sure that you get them in the care of medical professionals as soon as possible. So let's talk a little bit about stroke. So we have, these, we have this acronym, FAST, which stands for face drooping, arm weakness, speech difficulty, and T is for time to call 911. So if you have any of these symptoms, again, call 911 immediately and get to a hospital. So sudden, sudden numbness or weakness of the face, arm, leg, especially on one side of the body. Uh, sudden confusion, trouble speaking or understanding. Sudden trouble seeing or blurred vision in one or more um, or both eyes. Sudden trouble walking, dizziness, loss of balance or coordination. And a sudden severe headache without a known cause. And so you see that you can see the A in arm weakness. So one of the things um, I tell people to do, if you are feeling like something is not right, one way that you could maybe figure out if you're having a stroke is that I don't have enough space here is to hold both your arms straight out to the side. If one of the arms droops down and you can't hold it equal with the other, I mean, outside of having you know some type of shoulder issue, that is a symptom of a stroke. So now that we talked about heart disease and what it is and what stroke it is and what the symptoms are, let's talk about the good news. So 80% uh, of the time, heart disease can be preventable by making healthy choices. And so we're gonna go over what those seven choices in uh, Life Simple 7. So, you know, we really wanna build a healthy lifestyle, you know, for ourselves, for our families, 
and for our communities. Okay, so building a culture of health through life simple seven. So we have these seven tips and they're all, they're pretty much all interrelated. You have stop smoking, eat better, get active, lose weight, manage your blood pressure, control your cholesterol and reduce your blood sugar. Most people have no idea that high blood sugar um, is a risk factor for heart disease. They really only think about fat and cholesterol. So we'll go through all of this and I'll explain as best I can. Please know I am not a medical professional, um, but I have been educated in a lot of these issues related to how to live a healthy lifestyle. So the first of Life Simple 7 is to eat better. So we have eat a healthy diet here. Um, you know, here's a heart hat for you. You know, some people don't like vegetables. <laughs> I think one of the reasons why we don't like vegetables is because our parents boiled them in water and then gave them to us. They weren't very necessarily creative on how they served these vegetables. And so did you know that roasting veggies um, at a high heat will caramelize them and reduce bitterness and grilling fruits will unlock a deeper sweetness. So I think about my son who is nine, who has been eating Brussels sprouts, which I would never eat as a child has been eating Brussels sprouts since he was about five or six years old because I roasted them in the oven with garlic and um, olive oil and he really, really likes it. And so, you know, you can eat a healthy diet without jumping on a lot of the fad diets, which are very hard to maintain um, and really maintain a healthy eating pattern that is really the key. So that your eating pattern is really key. And there's more information on heart.org and on our Eat Smart page about diet um, patterns, but really concentrate on things like smaller portions rather than forcing yourself to eliminate the foods you love like carbs or meat or sugar. Um, add fiber rich foods that will keep you feeling full such as whole grains, legumes, vegetables, and fruits. I recall um, somebody suggesting I wanted to lose some weight for an event and somebody said, oh, we just eat meat and vegetables. Well, Legumes are not part of, <laughs> are not in the category of meat and vegetables. And so I never felt full. And I thought to myself, this is, I don't know how anybody could maintain this lifestyle. So we want you to have a healthy dietary pattern. And you know, and don't fill up on or even buy a lot of empty calorie foods such as sugary drinks. If they are in your pantry, you're less likely to indulge, indulge in them. So how do we do this? We wanna eat more fruits and vegetables, whole grains, low fat dairy products, skinless poultry and fish, nuts and legumes, non-tropical vegetable oils, lean meats, including red meat. We want to eat less saturated fat, trans fat, sodium, fatty red meats, sweet and sugary drinks. So let's talk about portion sizes. You know, in our culture, it's very popular when we go, especially when we go out to eat, is to want a lot of uh, value for the money that we spend. And when we look at fine dining establishments and they give these small portions and we think, well, well that seems like a scam. And we look at what we get at maybe a, a casual dining restaurant and they pile our food, our plate full of food. We're like, yes, this is good. This is really good. But you know, we really have to be aware of serving sizes. For instance, three ounces of cooked meat is about the size of a deck of cards. <laughs> and I know you may be thinking that's a very small amount of meat, but when you go to a steakhouse and get a 12 ounce piece of meat, that's actually four servings. So again, we talk, we're talking about portion sizes. So you really wanna decrease your portion sizes. So you don't have to eliminate that uh, lean cooked meat. You just wanna you know, lower or reduce your portion sizes. One of the things I love to do, and it probably drives everybody I know crazy, is that I read the nutrition facts um, on labels. Because for the most part, we have no idea what we're eating and what we're putting into our bodies. So nutrition fact labels can tell us a lot about food when it comes to reducing blood pressure. We wanna limit our intake of salt. So just take the time to redo, re review the label for this information. Keep in mind, the salt in food is not what we add with our salt shaker. It's already present, and especially in processed foods. Ideally, we wanna keep our sodium intake to less than 2,300 milligrams per day 
and closer to 1500 if we are at risk for cardiovascular disease. Um, if you look at this product right here, it has over 40% of the recommended amount for the whole day. So look for products noted as sodium free or very low sodium. So if you're thinking, you know, we don't know what this label is for, but if you look at it, 930 milligrams of sodium with something that has 240 calories, 240 calories is not going to be most likely a very filling a meal because it's not a lot of calories. Um, and it seems just glancing at, oh, this is good. It's eight grams of protein, the dietary fiber. It looks, you know, the sugar is only five grams, but the sodium and it's in everything. Also look for foods to, that are um, low total. You know, it's, it's in, like, I can't emphasize enough. It's really important the time to nutrition fact labels. The label will break down the total fat into saturated fat, which remember is bad, poly and monounsaturated fats, which are the better option. Ideally, saturated fat should represent less than 10% of your total caloric intake. Um, not only, so this is a candy bar I found, I've, I've realized, uh, this, this candy bar has over 30% um, percent fat and 65% of it is saturated. That's bad news for us. <laughs> well, above, well, it's well above the recommended amount. And if, if we could see the rest of the label, we would notice a lot of sugar and very few um, points of nutritional value. So strive for less than 5% of the daily value in each um, food item. So I wanna play a video here about, um, from Dr. Mark Watkins about, um, you know, in, being in the kitchen and eating healthy. We're helping people live healthier lives. Food, it's one of those things that can potentially put us on the wrong side of health without even knowing it. I'm a big fan of fresh food and also easy to prepare. The most important part, I think, for me is being a bit more mindful. I've slowed down when I eat. I've also enjoyed the company of people around me when I eat, so it's not just a race to the finish. We also want to make sure that eating healthy can be fun. It can also be cost effective. That's part of the commitment that we're making that's really about helping you live the best version of your life. Okay, so that was a lot. And that was just number one of seven, um, eat uh, better, eat healthy. So this next one, we're gonna talk about two and three, which are uh, being more active and maintaining a healthy weight or losing weight. So the American Heart Association recommends at least 30 minutes of moderate intense aerobic activity at least five days a week, which is about 100, which is 150 minutes total, or 25 minutes of vigorous aerobic activity, at least three days a week, 75 minutes total. And moderate to high intensity muscle strengthening activity at least two days per week for additional health benefits. So here's another heart hack we have here. Breaking your exercise into 10 to 15 minute routines in a day is just as effective as one long workout which that's great news. Think about if you have, um, if you have, you know, a busy day or you may not necessarily have the time or the energy to exercise for 30 straight minutes. Did you know that you could get up in the morning and take a 10 minute walk or do a 10 minute video on YouTube? Um, you could do another one at around lunchtime and you could do one after dinner and that's your 30 minutes and it's still, gives your heart the exercise and it still has the health benefits as if you did 30 minutes straight. So we can break that exercise up throughout the day as long as we're getting to that 30 minutes a day, five days per week, of, you know, walking, moderate intensity, things like that. And so this slide kind of gives you 
um, just some more information that you can see. Um, it kind of breaks it out to you, for you. So you can see training, swimming, walking your dog, um, playing basketball, gardening, um, even cleaning are considered, um, it's considered exercise. And then muscle strengthening again, um, at least two days a week. So lifting some weights, doing some push-ups, things like that. And again, this helps with your activity levels and with um, maintaining your weight. So that was one, two, and three. So this is four, five, and six. Blood pressure, cholesterol, and blood sugar. But before um, we get into that, I think one of my slides may be out of order. I'm just gonna give this heart hack, hack, which is the oils you cook with play a key role in raising or lowering your cholesterol. So what we're gonna watch now is a video series that we, off, we have for free on our website at heart.org forward slash habits. And I'll put that in the chat at the conclusion of my presentation, which helps you to maintain those healthy habits we talked about in one through three. Has this ever happened to you? You decide it's time for a big change, a fresh start, a new healthy habit. On day one, you're pumped and ready to go. But the next day, ugh, not so much. You're tired and just not feeling it. Why is it so hard to stick with healthy habits? The answer probably isn't what you think. In this episode of the Habit Coach series, we're going to bust some of the myths you were taught about behavior change. No pain, no gain. We think getting healthier means doing things you don't like. But if you're suffering, you're not likely to keep going. It's not just common sense, it's science. Breakthroughs in brain science show that positive emotions are actually what make habits stick. Myth two is that if you want to see big results, we need to make big changes. This leads us to choose ambitious new habits that are designed to fail, like changing our whole diet or starting an exercise routine that's way beyond our fitness level. But what we now know is that if you want big change, you have to start small. In fact, the smaller and simpler a new routine is, the more likely it is to become a habit. Myth three is that our new habits don't stick because we aren't motivated enough. While motivation is part of the equation, experts say you really shouldn't rely on it. Motivation is usually high at the start of a new habit, but it will inevitably crash. A well-designed habit works even on days when you're not feeling motivated. Now that we've busted all those myths, relax. You're not to blame when a habit fails. It's time for a new approach that actually works. In the next episode, you'll learn how the brain forms habits and how to hack that system. Okay, so as I mentioned, this is a six part video series that's available on our website at heart.org forward slash habits for free. And all six videos are really well done. They, we, we worked with a behavioral agency to help us um, to you know, come up with these videos. And I'm really excited about how they turned out. And I really think it can really have a great impact on people's lives and teach them how to um, build habits. And it's funny because, you know, whenever I talk to my husband, I, see, I remember during the pandemic, when the pandemic first started, I said, you know, we should try exercising 10 minutes before dinner. He said, 10 minutes, that's not enough. And I'm like, yes, 10 minutes. And he wanted to do the hardest exercises he could think of. And I said, if you make it too hard for yourself, because we you know we've been sitting around in the house, we're out of shape now. If we sit, if we make it too hard, we're less likely to do it tomorrow. And I had figured that out before um, this was even, I had even got into this position and learned about how habits work. And so we want you to take on bite-sized habit changes and that will really help you to be successful. So let's talk about blood pressure. This was a big one. Um, they don't call it the silent killer for nothing because for the most part, people with hypertension don't have any symptoms. So looking at this um, PowerPoint, we have um, what normal is, is less than 120 and less than 180. So 120 over 80 or below. Elevated is considered 120 to 129 over less than 80. 
Um, hypertension stage one, as you see, as you see here on the screen, is 130 to 139 over 80 to 89. And so when you look at these different stages, if you're um, it's very important that you monitor at home if you don't, if you don't, um, if you have no idea what your blood pressure is, of course you should visit your doctor regularly. But if your doctor is concerned about your blood pressure, you should have a home monitor and then you should be able to, you should track it. Um, you know, every day or so, so that you can get an idea of what your blood pressure is, so that you know if you are jumping into stage two or, or stage three. Um, stage three is a hypertensive uh, crisis, which means that, you know, you need to talk to your doctor right away and possibly go to the emergency room because when you're in a hypertensive uh, crisis, you're at risk for a stroke. We want to avoid that as possible. So the American Heart Association has partnered with the National um, Health Institute for a grant to really work to get people taking their blood pressure. And they made this really fun video to remind people how important it is to check their blood pressure. Flip it, cuff it, check it. High blood pressure silently affects millions of Americans. Staying on top of your blood pressure is as simple as these four easy steps. Self-monitoring is power. Visit manageyourbp.org to learn more. Dina, you're muted. About that, I'll go on mute when I play the video so there's not an echo. So we know that um, sodium has a really big impact on our blood pressure, but so does stress. Um, now this statistic uh, or this statement was before the pandemic, which said the World Health Organization's named stress as the health epidemic of the 21st century. And when they said this, they had no idea how much stress levels were going to increase um, during the pandemic. You know, stress sets off a chain of responses that are linked to heart disease, diabetes, disability, substance abuse, and premature death. Chronic stress has been linked to unhealthy lifestyle choices that can lead to high blood pressure. And stress is more, more than likely affecting your health if you frequently suffer from head, neck, back aches, sore muscles, feeling tired or trouble sleeping or feeling anxious or depressed often. So what can we do? So exercising regularly is a big one. That's the number one way to reduce stress is exercise. It can relieve stress, tension, anxiety, and depression, and consider a, you know, consider a nature walk, meditation, or yoga. Um, and we're going to do a quick um, a meditation in a moment. And then you know, make times for friends and family. That social interaction also helps with stress. Um, it's important to maintain social connections and talk with the people that you trust. Sleep. Can't emphasize this one enough, which is hard to do sometimes when you're stressed out. But getting enough sleep, adults should aim for seven to nine hours a night. Um, maintaining a positive attitude, practicing relaxation, you know, techniques while listening to music, and finding a stimulating hobby that can um, be fun and also distract you from negative thoughts or worries. And so, you know, again, all of this information in various forms are found on our website at heart.org. But I'm going to play. Um, a stress buster quickly. Um, and I hope that everyone will follow the words on the screen and participate with me.
So that you get that inhale twice quickly through the nose and then one sigh. <sighs> if you do that five to 10 times, it's um, proven to be able to uh, help you to calm down. So that's a great, um, this is a great strategy, especially when you're suffering acute stress, like hearing really bad news or something that's really upsetting or just being overwhelmed. Like if you have a really busy day and the, the things you need to do, your to-do list is getting bigger and bigger and the time is getting shorter and shorter and you're feeling that acute stress, you can take those two quick, deep, deep, quick breaths through the nose and one deep sigh out. <sighs> okay. And so that was um, four, five, and six. So now, oh my goodness, we're almost at the end. This is uh, number seven, which is don't smoke. And this also applies to um, smoke ex nicotine exposure. So even if you don't smoke, if you're around somebody who's smoking in a confined space, that secondhand smoke, you know, is really uh, dangerous. So our heart fact is quitting smoking has immediate health benefits and only 20 minutes after quitting your blood pressure and heart rate recover from cig the cigarette induced spike. So who knew that smoking cigarettes cause your um, heart rate to spike? I had no idea. I didn't know that until I started working at the American Heart Association. What I did know is that um, because of this, you think about diabetes. And again, I mentioned I'm not a health professional, but if you think about diabetes, um, people with diabetes, their blood is kind of thicker than normal blood. And so when you smoke, it also restricts your blood vessel. So if someone is diabetic and has that kind of thicker blood in these constricting vessels, they are really setting themselves up to have a stroke. So it's very important that we, we figure out ways to quit smoking. So here in Pennsylvania, and I'm sure every state has this, a free quit line where you can just call 1-800-QUIT-NOW um, and they have coaches. So they help you set a quit date, um, build your social support network, uh, develop coping methods for different triggers. Um, they help you to make your environment tobacco free. Um, they figure out what medication might help you set up and help you set you up with a free supply. Um, they have multi multilingual coaches. And, and when you call, your coach can also talk with you about setting up a text messaging services to keep you on track. And, you know, we talk a lot about smoking, but we, as we know, vaping is a huge um, issue right now. So the FDA just uh, made illegal these flavored um, vaping pens, which the American Heart Association lobby, along with I'm sure a variety of health organizations lobby to stop because those, those vaping pens, they really target children. And um, I mentioned how, you know, your heart um, um, can get better. And I'm gonna go back a little bit and talk about smoking a little bit more from, you know, from, from not smoking, you can, your lungs and everything can, can, can be healed. So, Smoking is the single largest cause of preventable death in the U.S. Um, 500,000 people die from smoking every year. Um, 80,000 of those people are, are people who are exposed to secondhand smoke. Um, if you smoke, you know, finding a way to quit is the best thing you can do for your health because let's go over these things that happen after you quit. I mentioned in your first 20 minutes that the um, heart rate and blood pressure induced spike goes down. After two weeks to three months of living smoke-free, your circulation and lung function will begin to improve. One year after quitting smoking, a person's excess risk of coronary heart disease is reduced by 50%. So that's cut in half. After just five years, your risk of cancer of the mouth, throat, esophagus, and bladder are cut in half, and your risk of cervical cancer and stroke return to normal. And after 15 years, your risk of coronary heart disease is the same as non-smokers. So that's, that's encouraging that, you know, although the smoking has done damage, that it can be reversed. But please know that with children and teens, I'll say, who are vaping, their lungs are not fully developed. So they may not have the same benefits from quitting. So they, we have to make sure that they don't start and that they understand why it's so important for them 
not to even get started messing around with nicotine, especially with underdeveloped lungs. So that concludes my formal presentation. And I saw things were happening in, a ch in the chat box. So <laughs> I'm not sure if there were questions for me or um, if not, well, that was 16 participants, not 16 chat messages. So if anybody has questions, I will do my best to answer them. As I mentioned, I am not a medical professional or a nutritionist or a dietitian or any of those sorts of things, but I have through, um, some training at work and going on 10 years with the American Heart Association. I have learned a lot. And this presentation was not developed by me. It was developed by people with skills and reviewed by our science um, review commission. You know, well, we're so uh, thankful and I'm inspired actually by your um, sharing. And I, I see a question from Betty. Betty, do you wanna unmute and um, ask your question? Sure. So what would you recommend is the best oil for cooking and the best oil for salads? Sure, so the American Heart Association encourages people not to use tropical oils. And so when we talk about fats, and again, it's almost anything you can think of, you can hit heart.org forward slash fats, and you probably would get to a page that will, <laughs> will explain this, you know, will give you the information, but you know, um, extra virgin olive oil, corn oil, um, you know, avocado oil. We don't encourage people to use coconut oil because that's a tropical oil. And you know, a few years ago, coconut oil was the thing. Everybody was talking about it because you could do a million things with it. You could put it in your hair, you could put it on your skin, you could cook with it. You can use it to brush your teeth. And those things are all fine, but not cooking with it <laughs> because coconut oil is high in saturated, saturated fat. And so, you know, I think, you know, it's really important, you know, on our website, you can find this information if you just go to heart.org and even search fats. But yeah, those non-tropical cooking oils are key um, to, you know, making sure you're having the healthiest oils and getting that good fat. All right, so and I did drop in the chat the heart.org habits to, to help you, um, whatever habits you want to start, this will, you know, this series will help you get started. And there's some articles on there as well. So then here's a continuing question. What about coconut ice cream? <laughs> so coconut ice cream is made from, and I'm not a nutritionist or a food scientist, but coconut ice cream is made from the milk, I believe, coconut milk. Um, whereas coconut, and if you have a dairy allergy, and say you have a nut allergy, so you can't do almond milk ice cream and you can't do you know, cow's milk ice cream, coconut milk ice cream could be an, um, an alternative for you. But I would just encourage you to compare the labels between the different types of non-dairy um, ice creams to see what the fat is and what the saturated fat is. Thank you. I see a question from Tanya. Do you wanna unmute and share? If you're having trouble, I can read it. Go ahead. Yes. yes, I was just wondering for people who do enjoy steak, um, with the recommended um, ounce of, of three ounces, for example, a filet mignon is, is smaller in size, but it's just so thick. Would, would a piece of filet mignon almost be like maybe a six ounce just because it's thicker? <laughs> That's a like good smaller, smaller versus circumference, I guess, is what I'm trying right. to say. It's really about the weight. So you wouldn't necessarily okay. be able to use the deck of cards as your um, the deck of cards as your guide. So it's really okay. about so you know when you go to a restaurant, they start at six ounces. Okay. And most of them do eight and 12, <laughs> you go to a steakhouse, they'll offer you a 12 ounce steak and you can order if you want to, but just don't eat it all. <laughs> and definitely not, don't eat it. I don't know, you, could you freeze it? I don't know, but eating it three days in a row is probably not much better. Yeah. Okay. Great, Ethel Thank Malone you. has a, a question. Ethel, do you want to unmute? Yes, thank you. Uh, I was wondering, uh, is light olive oil as effective for cooking as the virgin olive oil? Let's see. Um, I think that is fine. Um, I did find, just quickly Google the list of oils that we recommend for cooking. 
And I'll put that in the chat. So it's canola, corn, olive, peanut, safflower, soybean, and sunflower oils. Oh, Those are the oils see, that we recommend. I see your list just says olive. It doesn't necessarily say virgin. I just don't like the taste of virgin olive oil. That oh, you know, it's okay. fine. <laughs> <laughs> as long as it's olive oil. Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't know that we have the oils not to use on our website. I'm not sure, but, um, you know, they're definitely, like I mentioned, the coconut oil. And mm -hmm. I, I mean, I bet who, who didn't grow up eating vegetable oil? I think we all use vegetable oil. Right. And it's not healthy. Go ahead. Betty has a question. Okay. Hey, are there any food additives that we should avoid? Food additives. I don't think so. Um, the Heart Association does, um, we have uh, recipes and I can put that link in the chat as well. And, and when you think about our recipes, we, they're all, they all meet a certain scientific criteria, which include that they're low sodium and low in sugar. And so we do have some recipes that have small amounts of sugar, but we also have recipes that have, um, you know, stevia and things like that in them, a, a sugar substitute. Hopefully that came close to answering your question. <laughs> yes, so I use stevia, I've been using it for years in my coffee. Um, how do you feel about, oh, I'm trying to think of what those other ones are, NutraSweet, I think, are those, those are they healthy? Let's see. Um, I'll I'm not that knowledgeable on what the AJ science is on the sugar substitutes. But what I can also do is provide the link to our sugar page. We have we have a, a landing page for everything that you can think of. <laughs> and Thank you. that way on your, you know, when you get a chance, you can review that. But like I said, I know we do have um Stevia is plant-based, so we do have stevia um, in recipes. Dina, how do you feel the medical establishment is doing with women who come in presenting with symptoms? You know, I, I know um, maybe five to 10 years ago, it was often women would come in, they would say, oh no, right? It's nothing, go home. And it really was heart related. So do you feel like the medical establishment is getting better in terms of uh, you know, knowing women's risk factors, identifying them sooner, um, and then treat, you know, treatment on the spot? Better, yes. Statistically, yes. Are there still issues? Yes. We have, um, you know, Go Rare for Women was, was started because there was no research being done on the female body. And Women oftentimes went into the hospital with the, the, those symptoms I mentioned, like stomach pain and jaw pain and um, uh, sweating and different symptoms like that. They were told, oh, it's, you, you just need to calm down. You know, it's just anxiety, you know, just go home and lay down. And unfortunately, a lot of women didn't wake up after they laid down. And so we worked really, we worked really hard with the medical um, feel to make sure that doctors, especially ER doctors, are aware of these signs and symptoms of heart disease. Because we even had a woman, um, Dawn Angelique Roberts, who um, was a, a, a distance runner. She ran marathons. She did five, not marathons, she did 5Ks and 10Ks, was very healthy. And all of a sudden, she couldn't complete runs. She just couldn't do it. And she was working with a doctor and he was just very dismissive of her. And you know, you, you still are gonna run into those doctors who don't take a woman's, um, what they're saying about how they feel seriously. And so he just really was dismissive, 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 wouldn't pay her any attention. And she ended up, she lived in Delaware. A friend of hers ended up telling her about her cardiologist at a hospital in Philadelphia, um, who happened to be a female cardiologist. She went and saw her. And, um, you know, she said, I don't know what's wrong with you. This doesn't make any sense. And so she ran tests and within minutes of her taking a stress test, she realized something wasn't wrong, something was right, something wasn't right. And she was able to identify a very rare heart defect that this woman had developed. And now she's on medication 
And now she's back to her normal self and she's living a very uh, active and healthy life. But had she not advocated for herself and you know, start telling people what she was experiencing and the problems that she was having, doing her own research, thinking, you know what? I know somebody who has a woman who had who, you know, had a massive heart issue and ended up in the hospital. Let me talk to her. She really advocated for herself and did it on her own. And so once she got this diagnosis and got put on treatment, you know, she works in Philadelphia, so it's not too bad for her to travel to Philadelphia for her appointments. She did contact the doctor who really didn't have much to say but she would have left behind her husband and her young son had she not advocated for yourself, for herself. So if you feel like something is, is not right and you're not getting the answers that you need, it's important that you are your biggest advocate and you talk to anybody who you can find to get a recommendation for a doctor that's gonna take um, your symptoms seriously and not say, oh, you're probably just stressed or... Because a person who runs 10 Ks should be able to walk across a room. Will we all agree to that? <laughs> yeah. We will all agree. And so when she was out of breath, something is definitely wrong. I mean, so many tests should have been done. And if he couldn't figure it out, he should have started asking his colleagues and trying to figure out why can this healthy woman in her 40s who's been doing 10Ks, why is she so sick? It's yeah. not in her brain. It's not a, it's not a, it's not mental, it's physical. Yeah, no, thank you so much. Just two last comments. And I think then we might turn over to Ethel Malone. Uh, Janet Mills has this great comment. She says, I like nutritional yeast as a salt substitute, Parmesan cheese flavored. That is fantastic. <laughs> I've never That's tried perfect. that, Janet. So I love that. And then Tanya affirms what you've been saying, you know, um, which is we must be advocates for ourselves and our health, which, um, yeah, we, we just really appreciate you um, as a resource too. I'm going to turn it um, to Ethel Malone, who's going to share a word of gratitude. Absolutely a word of gratitude. Thank you so much, Gina, for coming and sharing your your information. And I think that your personality also helped us to get enthusiastic about what you were presenting also. And um, one of the things I especially like about your talk about how heart disease affects women is the fact that you, we heard you were interested and you gave us sources to which we could go for more information. So thank you so much for being with us. And it's been a pleasure and you've really given us some valuable information. Thank you. My pleasure. It's so nice to spend the afternoon with you all. Thanks for having me. And thanks, Janet, for the invitation. Thank you, Dina. On behalf of Cosro of Pennsylvania, we thank you for being here today. And I just want to end today with a, a few little words. I, I'd like to thank you all for attending our event today. Our next event will be entitled Be Red Cross Ready, How Women Can Be Prepared in Disaster Events, you know, like um, floods and earthquakes and things like that. We don't really feel like we have those things in this area, but if you watch the news, you'll see that flash floods happen everywhere and um, not, not just maybe not earthquakes, but tornadoes or, you know, just things that we don't usually expect. So we have two speakers lined up from the National American Red Cross, Sabangale Satol and Heather Bowman. They're very experienced. Um, and we, um, when we have a final date ready and picked, we will send the flyer and we hope that you will all attend that event as well. And the final thing is look for a three question survey from our committee um, asking your preferences on future subjects that we can talk to you about. Remember, we are about education, advocating and celebrating women and helping the church recognize every woman for her ability to help in the church and to be part of God's human family and for the need to us for us to be involved. So. Our closing in our closing prayer today will be from Tanya Goodwin. Everyone, let's bow our head in prayer. Almighty God, we come before you today thanking you for this time that we have been given to gather together. We ask that your Holy Spirit would be with us and guide our thoughts and words as we share with one another. 
We lift up each person here in prayer, asking that you would bless them in whatever ways they need. Give your strength to those who are weak, your wisdom to those who are seeking, and your love to all. We pray for Cosro as a whole, asking that nothing would be hidden from you, Lord. Let the work we do here glorify you in all things. We thank you for this place where we are given the opportunity to work hard for you, Lord. We pray all these things in your son's most precious name. Amen. Amen. One last thought. You don't have to be a United Methodist to come on to these events. If, if it's something that you're interested in, if it's something that you want to find out more about, please attend. There will all be free. Thank you for attending once again. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Good Bye, everyone. Friends. Thank you.